please be seated and I'll pray. Father God, what sweet words those are, knowing that all we bring to the table are many sins, and yet your mercy covers those. Lord, thank you for that. In your name, amen. Hi, thanks for being here today. Um, this is the part of our service where we celebrate the Lord's Supper. In a minute, men will come by with a piece of cracker and a little glass of juice. And the cracker is there to symbolize Christ's body. And the juice is there to symbolize Christ's blood that was spilt for us. And so we're going to spend the next few moments remembering that and remembering Jesus. Um, there are men in the front with Bibles. Uh, if you don't have one, we'd love to put one in your hand. So just raise your hand up and they'll bring one to you. And while they're doing that, if you could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll be reviewing the first five verses of that chapter this morning. Today as we prepare, um, I want to give you a little bit of background. Acts chapter 18 actually informs a lot of what's happening in this passage. And so in Acts chapter 18, we see that Paul had recently gone from Athens to make tents with Priscilla and Aquila while he preached the gospel in Corinth. As was his practice, he started at the synagogue preaching to the Jews. His message was rejected, so he went to the Gentiles and spent 18 months teaching the word of God there. As far as Corinth goes, it was a large port city. It was a major commercial hub. It was marked by Roman cultural values. And I read that the core city culture were those of trade, business, entrepreneurial pragmatism in pursuit of success. That sounds a lot like a place I live. It sounds a lot like my everyday life. So with that background, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And when he came to you, brethren, or when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Today, I want to review five truths about the testimony of God from Paul in this passage. The first truth is right there at the beginning. The testimony of God is not rocket science. In verse 1, Paul says he didn't come in superiority of speech or of wisdom. Have you ever approached God's word feeling inadequate for study? Have you ever said, I'm not sure that I can explain the gospel well and use that as a reason to not share it? Paul eliminates that argument by confirming that he came to share the simple gospel of Christ, which leads us to the next truth. The verse that many of us have memorized is verse 2. I am determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Paul taught the gospel. He taught that we are all sinners in need of a savior. He taught that Jesus came to be that savior and that Jesus' death on the cross was the propitiation for our sins. Let me say that another way. Our sin alienated us from God. It was the guilt of sin that separated us from him. Mercifully, Jesus on the cross assumed that guilt and paid the penalty in his own blood and thus removed the cause for alienation. Now a holy and righteous God can bestow mercy on a believing sinner on the basis of justice satisfied. Jesus' death on the cross brought the believing sinner mercy. The testimony of Christ's death is that God is that Christ came to save sinners. The third truth about the testimony of God is that the context for the testimony of God can be contentious. There was much persecution during Paul's time in Corinth, so much so that in Acts chapter 18, verses 9 and 10, the Lord comforted Paul with a dream, saying, Do not be afraid any longer. Go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you. For I have many people in this city. The gospel is not a difficult message, but it is not one that's easy to hear. 
If we are to testify of the gospel, we also have to be ready for people to reject it, probably people we love. The fourth truth is that the testimony of God is a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Look back at verse four, and it says, my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in, in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. There's such a comfort in knowing that my power of persuasion does not save people. The Holy Spirit testifies of God, which leads us to the last truth. The testimony of God produces God-powered faith. Verse five says, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. As Josh taught us a couple of weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the scripture says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul preached with the Holy Spirit and power, and that power of God is what our faith, Christians, rests on. Let's for a second think if the wisdom of God is what saves us. Imagine for a second that you believe in evolution, that the universe just developed over a long period of time. This is a theory that is being taught as fact within academics today. However, this theory is changing so rapidly that two years ago, I went to the Field Museum in Chicago, and most of the evidence they showed was outdated from the current facts about evolution. No longer the latest thinking is even what they're displaying as the fact. Their own museum can't even testify to their belief system. This is the wisdom of man. Now think about if you put your eternal faith in the men that reason their ways to these facts about the universe. How would you feel about those chances? We know from scripture the answer to that question. It was written in this book thousands of years ago. Our faith rests in the power of the same God that created the universe by speaking it into existence. That power is what saves us. That is a power worth trusting. Christian, as we seek to remember Christ this morning, please think of the testimony of God. Think of the power of God in your salvation and be thankful. Jesus came to the earth to save sinners. This act of love and mercy was put on full display at the cross. And if we confess our sins and see God's position towards us change through Christ's death, we will be saved. However, if you don't believe, I wanna beg you to put your faith in Christ right now. Recognize that God sees your sin and seek his forgiveness. However, if you do not do that, please let the bread and the cup pass by as the time of communion is a time of worship reserved for those who believe in Christ. If you have any questions about this, please see me or one of the elders or the person you came with after the service. We'd love to talk to you about our Savior. Men, can you please do so, or can you please serve us? And as you do, um, take communion on your own today, and I'll come back and pray for us.